you know, Asian clam is a big challenge and the rapid response efforts have been very successful where we found them. That's the trick. Um, where we found them, we've matted them and we've had great success in virtually suffocating the clams under the mats, uh, which requires a significant amount of resources to seal the mats along the edge with rebar, to pin them down with sandbags, to have divers in the water to continually maintain those mats because they can be disturbed by weather events, by boat traffic, um, and even by swimmers in the water or by runoff from the land. The benthic barrier mats are the most effective where we have fairly consistent sediment on the lake bottom. In certain areas where we have rocky substrate or more organic matter on the bottom of the lake, we've tried some suction harvesting um, studies. And in one case, we set up a series of sediment curtains which closed off the one embayment, one bay there, and we had a, a contracted crew come in and, and literally vacuum up the sediment and the leaf litter that was in between the rocks and some of the muckier material that was very hard to get a seal around. And so when they suck that up, they, they suck it up into what they call a dewatering bag, which is a huge bladder on the land, um, and the sediments settle out in the bladder and the excess water rises to the top and is filtered and goes back into the lake. It is one technique that we've been investigating because benthic barrier matting is not the answer for every area on the bottom of Lake George. We think that this, uh, this site was originally introduced about three years ago and now we're at about uh, uh, a little over five acres. So, and that's in three years and it's an exponential growth situation. So if in three years you have five acres and you could figure out the, the exponent, you could certainly get into how, how much spread uh, from that. And so you could probably make an estimate of within 10 years to 15 years, they'd be throughout Lake George and into Champlain. Researchers in Lake Tahoe found Asian clam in their system in early 2000s, 2001, 2002. Um, it may have been a case of misidentification or just not understanding exactly what the threats of Asian clam could be to Lake Tahoe, and it was let go. Uh, it was sort of noted but not paid much attention to. Unfortunately, by the year 2008, they noticed that they had very dense beds of dead Asian clam shells and live Asian clams growing on top of dead Asian clam shells. And they started to note them because there were algal blooms in the water above those dense beds of Asian clam shells. Now, Lake Tahoe is very similar to Lake George in terms of lake use, um, and, and the kinds of expectations that users have for that water body. How could Asian clams specifically um, cause harm to the Lake George system? Well, economically, if we have really dense beds of them, and we are starting to see dense populations of them where they, you know, where we are not having successful management, um, they could cause algal blooms. And we don't know how that would affect business. I mean, if folks show up to a nice a motel or a hotel on Lake George and the water has algal blooms in it, I'm guessing they probably don't want to swim in the water. They might think of recreating somewhere else. That would be a huge economic loss to the region. So as soon as we found Asian clam in Lake George, um, it was very quick to pick up the phone and call Lake Tahoe and say, we know you have Asian clam, we know you're trying to manage them, what similarities and differences do we have and what advice can you give us? And very shortly after that we had researchers and scientists coming to Darren Freshwater Institute on Lake George to share their research and expertise. Uh, that was really uh, important in facilitating the rapid response because they basically gave us a blueprint of this is how you do it, now you need to adapt it to your system. I would say that, you know, we are still, we have been in rapid response mode for Asian clam in Lake George for the past three years. Um, we have to reevaluate every year when we find a new population, uh, in, if in fact we are moving on to a long-term management and control and containment program. And that may be the fact for Lake George with Asian clam. Trees in Vermont are not immune from invasives and the state is beefing up its security in preparation for a long struggle. You know, we have some uh, pests that are already here that are already killing trees that are exotic, the beech bark disease, the Dutch elm disease, a lot of uh, pests are already established. But of the ones that are on the horizon, the one that we're most afraid of right now is emerald ash borer. And that's because it's an insect that's going to get here, and when it gets, he gets here, it's going to kill trees. 
Emerald ash borer was first detected on the continent uh, about 10 years ago in the Detroit area and nearby Ontario. Right now it's in 17 states in this country. That's a third of the states in the United States now have emerald ash borer. In its native China there are ash trees and those trees have evolved with emerald ash borer and it's not an important uh, forest pest in uh, Asia. But for our trees they don't have that, most of them don't have that resistance. So what's at risk? Well EAB is most of you probably already aware uh, it has a tremendous capacity to kill ash trees. Completely healthy ash trees. Uh, some work that's been done in southeast Michigan shows that EAB can kill nearly 100% of the ash trees. Anything from you know the one and two inch whips to the big, the big trees. So based on the, the numbers we had generated from 2008, uh, we had estimated the economic damage on the developed lands. In, in New England to be about $800 million over the next 10 years. That's about $130 to $150 million in Vermont alone. Emerald ash borer attacks only ash trees. It attacks all species of ash. Uh, in Vermont, the most common one is the white ash, and that's, that's what this beautiful tree is behind me right here. Some of the, some of the ways that uh, ash is really uh, important on beyond the fact that all, all species have their niche in the ecosystem is ash is an important timber tree in the state. Uh, tool handles, furniture, flooring, um, it's really a very desirable timber species. Ash is an important street tree. It was widely planted after Dutch elm disease killed a lot of the elm trees. The green ash particularly was planted there. There's about 100 million ash trees in Vermont, so there are a lot of trees at risk. Just this last year, emerald ash borer has been uh, detected in Connecticut and very recently in Massachusetts. The county in Massachusetts is within 20 miles of Vermont's southwestern uh, border. The new detections of emerald ash borer in Massachusetts was made with a purple panel trap. Those are the ones that you've seen hanging all over Vermont. That this last summer, there were over 1,400 of those traps in Vermont. I'm assuming that most people have seen these popping up in their areas. Um, in the big scheme of things, this is the quick and dirty method of blanketing the entire state. A, it provides information on the location and distribution and the actual movement of emerald ash borer. Um, it functions as a delimiting tool to determine the scope and the extent of the current known EAB infestations. And it provides um, the basis for uh, state governments and the federal government um, for management decisions. And it provides continuous assessment of the um, efficacy of the quarantine and control activities. The, the one thing I've noticed is really the perception of the public of these things. When I hung these things up a month ago, um, I was driving around and I was hanging these things in trees. And everybody would stop and say, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's that for? Are you catching bats? What are you like? And nobody really had any idea about it. And now most people just sort of slowed down and asked, have you found it yet? And so, <laughs> so the perception has changed. People are aware of what's going on. They're aware of what we're looking for. So the purple traps are baited with a couple different components that mimic um, a stressed tree volatile. Um, and the idea is that it would um, be attractive to emerald ash borer um, if it were in the area. It's, it's very hard to develop a trap that emerald ash borer can't resist. Uh, for gypsy moth, we have a trap that will draw gypsy moths in from miles away. Purple panel traps are kind of attractive to emerald ash borer. A detection of emerald ash borer on a purple panel trap is our sign that that insect is now in this community and we need to start looking at trees in the area, not only right where the trap is, but in a distance from the trap to see what trees it's actually living in and where that infestation is really located. If we think we have emerald ash borer in Vermont, the first time an insect is peeled off a panel trap that looks just like one, or someone finds galleries in a tree, the little tunnels in a tree that tell us this is probably emerald ash borer, what do we do next? Well, the first thing is we get someone to confirm that identity. Identification. There are look-alikes. We want to be sure. We don't want to panic when there is no need to panic. So getting a really, an expert that really knows their insects to confirm it for us is step number one. But right on the heels of that is step number two, delineating how widespread this infestation is. If we know where it is, we know where we need to focus our efforts on not moving it somewhere else. And that's why you see so many purple traps up is because we want to know where emerald ash borer is. And by knowing where it is and really isolating it where it is and keeping it from moving very quickly, that's the best tool that we have to protect trees in the future.
In wartime, propaganda has been used to win the hearts and minds of the people. With invasives, the dissemination of information is critical in slowing the spread as well as attracting cooperation. So Lake Champlain is really viewed um, often as a source of invasive species because there's so much traffic that comes and goes from our lake. Um, there are people who are here sailing, swimming, fishing. Um, there are a lot of bass fishing tournaments on the lake and what that means is we have a lot of people who come visit Lake Champlain from places far away in a short period of time. And they could be carrying with them unknowingly aquatic, we call them hitchhikers. Um, and whether that's uh, the resting egg stage of a clam or a plant fragment. Um, it could even be a fish pathogen that lives in water in the bilge water of a boat. Those can come into Lake Champlain and once they're here, people come and go from Lake Champlain so frequently that it could be transported to inland water bodies in the region. We often come back to the same message, which is check clean, drain, and dry. And there are specific ways by which you can do that. Um, you check your fishing equipment, you check your wading equipment, you check your scuba diving equipment, you check your anchor line on your boat, you look in your bilge water, you make sure it's drained, you can disinfect your live well. These are all ways by which you can prevent the movement of water from one body of water to another. When you're checking these things, you're looking for what's visible to the naked eye. Obviously, if you have mud or plants or a mussel hanging off of something, you need to remove that. But when, when we think about cleaning, we have to think about where could water be on my equipment or on my boat, and we need to make sure that we're cleaning that off and that we're drying it completely. It's an invasive species that I observe, uh, especially coming out of the lake, is uh, milfoil, uh, some coontail. Uh, every once in a while I get, a, I get one with zebra mussels on it. Them little things that I keep my eye on, and every once in a while, uh, I'll see a, um, a chestnut uh, on one of the trailers and sometimes uh, they'll attach themselves to the boat. Uh, but I uh, haven't seen a lot of that. There's uh, a little piece of coontail in that. How'd you do this one? Got any luck? Yeah, I got four, not 99%. They're very cooperative. They understand. They wash their boats. They clean their deep wells and that's gonna really help the problem. It'll help make the lake healthier, and, and that's what uh, the Lake Champlain Basin Program's whole intent is, to make the lake healthy. That looks great, sir. We're good to go. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Here, John. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Glad to help you out. Okay? Thank you very much. I used to, I fished on this lake all my life. I, I think the lake's getting healthier. I really do. I think that we can reduce the spread of invasive species movement in the region if everybody steps up and recognizes that their interaction with the water provides some risk of movement of invasive species and that folks take to heart me methods that they can do every day just to prevent the spread of any type of species from one body of water to another. Well, one of the main reasons we really want people to keep their eyes open for emerald ash borer is the importance of detecting it early. Um, because if you detect it early, you can keep it from spreading. And for us with emerald ash borer, it's all about buying time. We want people to uh, know that emerald ash borer exists so that then they don't move the insect from where it is now to where it isn't yet. Uh, we, we, we say that emerald ash borer can, is a strong flyer. It can move well on its own, but it can travel 65 miles an hour down the interstate. When people move wood products, usually firewood, um, it is the number one vector for transmitting emerald ash borer to a new site. If someone from Connecticut or Massachusetts is coming up to their second home or a ski place and they bring firewood, or if campers are bringing firewood from out of state into state, that is most likely the way we're going to get emerald ash borer um, infestation started. Of course, one of the most common places that people bring firewood is to campgrounds. And that happens during the summertime when the insects are likely to be emerging from the logs, so it's a particularly high risk time to be moving firewood around. And so in our Vermont State Parks, we're asking people not to bring firewood from more than 50 miles away. The private campground owners have been very cooperative in terms of encouraging their guests also to uh, not bring firewood uh, from, from far away locations. 